NATO have the capacity to supply Ukraine with all the military hardware weapons and supplies that Kiev needs to defeat Russia, or at least prevent any further territorial losses? In other words, could Ukraine win this war if NATO really wanted them to? No. Ukraine can't win this war. First of all, let's just talk about first principles. Um, this is a war of existential survival for Russia. Russia's fighting this war because NATO sought to carve Ukraine out of the Russian sphere of influence in a concerted effort to undermine Russia, destroy Russia, etc. Russia has nuclear weapons. So Russia will not lose this war or the world will end. Let's just start with that first principle. So anybody who says we can beat Russia, no, you can't because Russia is willing to use nuclear weapons to stay alive. Russia will not allow itself to be defeated because a Russian defeat means the end of Russia. And nuclear weapons sort of exist to prevent that outcome. So right off the bat, unless you're unless the West is saying that we all want to commit suicide for Ukraine, Ukraine cannot win this war because Russia will do that which it takes to win. But it doesn't matter. Russia's winning. You know, we could give Ukraine all the tanks in the world. Line them up. A million tanks. Give them a million tanks. Line them up. Ukraine had a military when this war began at 700,000. They're down to a little bit more than 200,000. They're running out of men. I've been saying all along they've been taking casualties. And only now people are starting to rate. Ra you know, I'm no idiot. I don't make numbers up. I, uh, you know, I, I've got this little computer thing. One of the reasons why I was a good intelligence officer is because I could look at a situation and assimilate the data and crunch the numbers and go, I think I know what the outcome is going to be. Now, you know, Scott, you thought they were going to take over uh, you know, Ukraine in seven days. Well, my God, I thought they were going to operate doctrinally. I didn't realize they're going to go in with a hand tied behind their back, jumping on one foot, singing Kumbaya, uh, because no one, no one thought of a special military operation except the Russians. And they had every right to do so. I understand why they did it. I understand all that stuff. But had they come in doctrinally, the war would have been over in one week. It. Because the Russians doctrinally can't be beat by anything either Ukraine or NATO can put up in front of them. Um, but the other thing is, once they settled down, the battlefield became a known. Um, I sat there and I said, the Ukrainians, and I said this back in June, I said, the Ukrainians lost about a quarter of a million guys dead. And everybody went, no, that's too high, man. That's too high. Well, they're up over 300,000 now. You know, it's acknowledged. Stratfor came out with a number. They said 305. I think the number's closer to 350. It's approaching 400,000 dead. KIA. Dead. Not, not KIA. Killed in action, buried under the ground, or left rotting in the fields. There are so many Ukrainian bodies out there that haven't been collected yet. I mean, they're going to be spending decades digging these guys out. Um that's just the reality of it. They don't have anybody left. They've taken about 70,000 troops and they've sent them off to Great Britain. Uh, we just saw airplanes land and discharge. Ukrainian tankers are going to be trained on the Challenger 2 tank. You know what I called them coming down the plane? Dead man walking. None of them are going to live. They, they better hope they never go to combat in the Challenger 2. They will all die. Every single one of them will die. That's what happens when you get hit by rounds that are designed, intended to cut through the Challenger 2. The British, what kind of stupidity do they think here? You think the Russians haven't been studying the Challenger 2 tank since the moment you conceived it in your, in your minds? That the second you fielded it, the Russians went, how do we kill that? And they said, well, here's, you know, we'll use this round out of our 122 millimeter uh, tank. We think we got that one answered. Uh, we've got anti-tank missiles that we have designed for it. You know, what, the British now have superb secrecy? The Brit Britons never, ever had Russian intelligence penetrate your defense secrets. You don't think that the, the Russians know exactly what Chobham armor is or whatever the follow-on is that you employed on Challenger. They got it. They got it in spades and they designed the weapons to destroy it. The same thing with the M1. They know everything, just like we know everything. That's why we know that they can destroy our tanks. And yet we're sitting here somehow thinking that 14, 14 Challenger 2 tanks are going to have an you know, an impact on the battlefield? Who, who came up with that math? 14. I mean, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. But they got 70,000 guys out there getting trained right now. They got a little over 200,000 on the front. Now, again, I ask people, if you recall, when um, when NATO said we're going to send tens of billions of dollars to, uh, to Ukraine back in May, um, I said, this is a game changer. 
because what it's going to do is give Ukraine a chance to absorb technology and then use it against an overextended Russian force. The Russians went in with too few troops, 200,000 troops, and they had frontages that were unsustainable with those number of troops. 200,000 troops on a 1,000 kilometer front means you have 200 people per kilometer, except you don't have 200 people per kilometer because most of those 200,000 aren't frontline combat troops. They're used in logistics, supply, communications, et cetera, and they're spread out all over. You have about 60 to 80,000 troops on that, which means 60 to 80 guys per kilometer. If you're lucky, that ain't enough. And it wasn't enough. What happened when the Ukrainians came in and massed 30, 40,000 guys? They punched through the lines. They got in the rear area. They disrupted. I just told you Ukraine has 200,000 troops. A lot of them are up right now trying to defend Kiev against the threat of a Russian attack coming out of Belarus. A lot of them are um, up along the, uh, the, the border with Belarus um, in case there's a threat there. They may have 140,000 troops along the front. But remember, some of those troops have to be deployed in the rear areas, etc. cetera. Um, the Ukrainians are in the same situation that the Russians were in. Too few troops, too great a frontage. And what are the Russians doing? First of all, in Bakhmut, they're grinding them down. Um, I mean, you know, this battle has been ongoing since May. The Ukrainians have lost anywhere from 14 to 20 brigades worth of troops. That's 5,000 troops per brigade, 90% casualty rate. Just add the numbers up if you want. Um, now what the Russians are doing is the, the Ukrainians have said, we're, we're, we're just going to keep doubling down on stupid there. We're going to keep throwing these brigades in. And Russia went, good. Uh, let's hit them in, in Zaporizhia. Now the Russians are advancing towards Zaporizhia. And the Ukrainians are like, holy cow. So they have to divert whatever reserves they have back to fight in Zaporizhia. Then the Ukrainians go, or the Russians say, let's go up to Uligar. Let's start an offensive up there. Uh, let's go to Krasnoy Limon. Let's do some stuff up there too. And they're pressing the whole front before they've even committed their reserves. This is just what they have on the front line. They're pressing. And the Ukrainians are taking whatever reserves they have, and they're throwing them out there, and they got nothing left. That's why they're running around taking guys out of their homes, picking people off the streets. They are desperate for manpower. They're begging Europe, all those brave Ukrainian uh, heroes that fled Ukraine and are living as refugees. Ukraine's saying, send them back, guys. We need them. We need manpower on the front because we got nobody left. Nothing. And at some point in time, the Russians are going to fire the green flare and uh, the main element is going to move towards the forward edge of the battle area, cross the line of departure. And it's all she wrote. Um, so, no, there's nothing. There's literally nothing that um, NATO or the United States can do short of directly intervening. But they don't have any troops. I mean, the United States got 100,000 troops in Europe, but we know what they are. Striker Brigade, Suicide Brigade, the 101st Airborne. <laughs> Light infantry ain't going to live long. A couple heavy armor brigades, they'll do right for a couple days, and they'll run out of ammunition, run out of fuel, run out of reserves, run out of sustainability, and they'll all die. Um, so what is what is NATO going to put up against the Russians right now? Nothing. This war is one Game, set, match, Russia. Um, you know, Zelensky sort of acknowledged that. He came out, the president of Ukraine came out and said, uh, I need those 31 Abrams. 31 Abrams. Again, game-changing numbers we're talking about here, guys. I'll be as sarcastic as possible. But he said, I need those Abrams by August or it's too late. What does he mean too late? Are you trying to tell me something, Mr. President? That if you don't have the American tanks by August, it's too late for what? A Ukrainian victory? Why? Because you know, you know what's about to happen. You know that the Russians are going to start this process of grinding you down and you've got no reserves left. And by August, it's all over. And that's just the statement of fact. That's a reality. That's what we're dealing with here. Now, the Russians should screw this up. I mean, we, we all know that, um, you know, any general, any army uh, can, can totally just <laughs> make mistakes. And um, Russia has shown a proclivity for making mistakes. Um, I think Russia has learned from those mistakes. Um, I don't think they're going to repeat the same error. I think uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why it's taken so long from September until now is that Russia not only has mobilized, but it is training them in the lessons learned from this fight. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty confident in my assessment. My next question is about the F-35. Uh, is the F-35 this over-engineered hunk of junk that some people say, or is it the future of warfare? Like, is, is one F-35 going to take out Russia? 
<laughs> completely win the war single-handed. If you listen to the proponents of the F-35, uh, they'll tell you it's literally a game-changing technology, that the uh, F-35 uh, is you know, comprised of a, a whole suite of technologies that go from stealth uh, to you know, advanced maneuverability, uh, uh, the ability to uh, use uh, near artificial intelligence to acquire targets, assign weapon systems, to take out a multitude of targets at the same time, to communicate with other F-35s so that they can do some fancy dance in the sky and shoot everything down and win the war all by themselves. Um, and then you talk to people who know anything about the F-35 and they'll tell you that uh, it just doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work as intended. Um, it has m a multitude of problems um, that it will basically break when you look at it. Uh, so even if the F-35 functioned as designed, um, getting it off the ground and to fly a combat mission and come back without having to be grounded to be repaired um, is virtually an impossible task. Uh, we don't have enough of them to, uh, to be able to put 60% of them on the ground and maintenance stand down while the other 40% fly and try to cycle planes through. Um, <clears throat> and it's just overhyped. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, an SU-34 can probably shoot down an F-35 in a, in a stand-up fight one-on-one -on -one just because it can outmaneuver it. Um, the F-35 doesn't, you know, it doesn't work as intended. Um, and, we, and the pilots sometimes don't know how it's going to perform when they ask it to perform. Um, whereas the, F, you know, the SU-34 is a, um, you know, a not, it's not a spectacular plane, but it's a good airplane. It can do the job. And uh, I think anybody who knows when you're drag racing, uh, you'd rather have the car that you know is going to start every time. And when you hit the accelerator, it's going to accelerate and the steering is going to work and air, the brakes are going to work. Everything, or, or do you want to be in the thing that you don't know? You start, it's going to blow up. Hit the acceleration, is it going to blow up? If you drive down, the steering is going to break and you're going to crash. That's the F-35. You have no idea what the F-35 is going to do when we use it in combat. So it has it has it never been used in, in actual combat? It's never been used in air-to-air uh, -air combat, which is supposed to be its forte. I do believe that the F-35 has been involved in um, flying uh, maybe some combat air patrols and um, maybe delivering some um, air-to-ground ordnance. Uh, um, but I, it's never, it's never, um, there's no F-35 aces out there, let's put it that way. But if it gets used in combat, there might be some SU-34 aces out yeah. there. So it's, it's never been fully tested no. to its full potential, right? Okay. Not in combat. Yeah, in people combat. will say that uh, what we do out in Nevada with red flag or whatever they call it nowadays um, yeah. is, you know, combat-like. Uh, but even then, um, the F-35 has never been able to perform to its full potential because it just doesn't work. Yeah, so if they fail to take the entire country, will um, whatever is left join NATO and be used immediately as another springboard to antagonize or attack Russia with? Well, I mean, first of all, how is Ukraine going to join NATO? I mean, it would be, um, it would require NATO to literally violate everything it ever stands for. Um, you know, nations that have ongoing territorial disputes uh, can't, can't join NATO because the second they join, NATO's at war because Article 5 will be automatically triggered. And I can't see... Um, responsible nation saying, yeah, we're ready to die because a war with Russia means nuclear conflict. So I don't see any scenario that has NATO or has um, Ukraine, whatever left with joining, um, joining, um, joining NATO. Um, the danger is to have a surviving Ukraine that's full of hate governed by people who hate Russians who continue to be supported by NATO uh, for a perpetual conflict, something of that nature. That's the danger. Um, and I think Russia recognizes that. That's why Russia's stated objectives are twofold, uh, demilitarization and denazification. Denazification means getting rid of a regime that supports this anti-Russian um, 
you know, policy direction that the current Ukrainian government does. Can this be done without fully occupying Ukraine? Well, I think Russia would like to believe it can. Um, that's why Russia is part of whatever future offensive appears to be being um, planned, uh, seems to be incorporating um, a standalone strategic air campaign component, similar to what the United States did to Iraq back in Desert Storm uh, 1990. Uh, and General Armageddon, General uh, Servikin, is in charge of this. This is the man who um, shut down the Ukrainian energy sector. And I think this is the man whose intention it is to collapse Ukraine as a modern nation state. And that's how I think this war is going to uh, be solved politically. I think that uh, Ukraine is going to be pounded in the submission, um, that they will be targeted in a way that just breaks down Ukrainian society's ability to sustain itself and that this will result in um, the political collapse of the Zelensky government and whoever replaces Zelensky uh, will be suing for peace based upon the uh, terms of, um, of Russia, which includes the, um, you know, delegitimizing Stepan Bandera's ideology and uh, extreme Ukrainian um, nationalism. Now people can rightfully bring out the fact that uh, We've never won a war by air power alone like that. I mean, the idea was, you know, we're going to bomb the Germans into submission. That didn't work. We had to put boots on the ground all the way to Berlin, and it was Soviet boots. Um, other people will say that Japan didn't uh, finally capitulate until we dropped two atomic bombs on them. I actually tended to disagree with that one. I think history shows that the Japanese were suing for peace, independent of that. But in that, one of the reasons why they're suing for peace is because the uh, what was happening with the strategic air campaign, the B-29 is just flying over Japan, uh, you know, leveling cities with firebombs. Uh, we didn't have to nuke them. Um, the, the, the Japanese had lost the will. And it was also, we were we were sinking their, uh, you know, it's a part of the war that a lot of people understand, but our submarine fleet was taking out their merchant navy. Japan was literally not able to bring in the supplies they needed to continue to survive. And I think Russia is going to impose some, that sort of air war on uh, on Ukraine, and the the damage will be um, be extensive, and uh, that's what is going to cause the collapse. And whatever government takes over is going to work with the Russians to ensure that whatever survives as Ukraine isn't going to be this cancer that's waiting to inflict more harm. It'll become what Russia has always wanted it to be, which is um, part of the Russian sphere of influence, oriented towards Moscow, working in concert with Moscow. Um, and not with the West. Yeah, J Japan was was finished before the nukes. The nukes were dropped as a, yeah. to warn and scare the Soviet Union. Soviet Union, yeah, yeah. no, we, yeah, I, I, no, we know that. Uh, I mean, a lot of Americans don't know that, but no, yeah. that's not what we're told at school. That's not the, what we're taught, but that is the real reason. So. Yeah, now, people just have to study, you know, John McCloy and the conversations he had with uh, with the Truman administration and the conversations that were held by uh, Forrestal and others. Uh, and, and, and if you study the totality of the documents, you you know that the uh, the real reason was to send a signal to the Soviet Union that we had something they didn't have, and because uh, there was worries after um, uh, Yalta that we had given away too much to the uh, Soviets in terms of post-war Europe, um, and um, the idea was to try and put pressure on them in the lead up to um, to Potsdam and and beyond. Um, but I mean, what the heck? It's only a couple hundred thousand Japanese. Who cares? They're just little yellow men, you know. And, and when we're talking about the white race, like America, you know, was at the time. Um, now, I'm being very sarcastic here. I, I, I think it's despicable the way we just trivialized the lives of, uh, of the Japanese, and it just sort of like, oh, well. I mean, <laughs> if we had invaded Japan, we would have lost a million Americans. Well, we weren't going to invade Japan. Uh, Japan was going to surrender. Yeah. But even then, there's no justification for dropping atomic bombs on cities and slaughtering humans, just like there's no justification for firebombing cities. I know, you know, the reality is we killed more Japanese firebombing Tokyo than we did in the uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima attacks, but that doesn't make it right. The recent strikes in, um, in Iran, um, what's, your, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, according to the Iranians, uh, they weren't that good meaning that they didn't accomplish what they were out to accomplish. Um, I don't see Iran overreacting. Um, 
because you know, that's sort of what people want them to do. Um, <clears throat> but it, 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 it is uh, worrisome because you, you have the Ukrainians insinuating that they were somehow involved. Uh, you know, they said, we warned you, uh, if, if you provide weapons to Russia, this will happen. Well, did you, did, was Ukraine behind this? Were the Israelis behind this? Were the Azerbaijanis behind this? Who was behind this? Um, but I, I, I just see this as part of the, uh, of a, expanding the scope and scale of this conflict. Now, uh, any nation that provides material support becomes a target, which is interesting because uh, when <laughs> When are the NATO countries going to be struck down? I mean, because you don't have to agree with what Iran's doing, but you do have to understand that Iran providing Russia with military equipment is no different from the United States, Germany, France, anybody else providing Ukraine with military equipment. And if you are going to legitimize the striking of Iran in retaliation, I guess we get the bomb um, Rheinmetall AG and blow them off the face of the earth because they produce leopard tanks. It's a dangerous escalation.